Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, today I'll be talking about the the extremism amongst the youths today. Uh, today there there's so much of uh, uh, extremism amongst the youths, wherein uh, people start using disparaging uh, statements uh, against each other on the social media and in their discussions they don't know how to have a reasonable argument uh, they go beyond bounds and um, you know insult one another and uh, they make really strong statements which if you think for once you might think where are we heading so that's what we're going to be discussing now inshallah um, you know I just come across some blanket statements made by some of the youths on the social media. Very irresponsible indeed. They say in one jiffy, they just make a statement saying that all Arab rulers are munafiqeen. They say that. They say that all Arab rulers are munafiqeen or they say they have become kuffar or disbelievers and all these statements they make in such a haste and without knowing the gravity of their statement they don't know what they are doing they don't know what kind of an utterance that is because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam very clearly warned against making statements of this kind in haste the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he warned the muslims from calling one another as kafirs and munafiqeen without proofs if at all a person calls another person as a kafir and if the person on whom the accusation is, if he is not a kafir, then it will return back to the one who calls him as a kafir. So this is a very grave issue, it's a very serious issue, but then the Muslims are getting into such loose talks wherein they just, you know, at one second they just call one another as kafirs and munafiks. Allahu Akbar, Allah has to safeguard us. So the main discussion here is about this issue of calling one another as kafirs and specifically when people are calling the scholars or the rulers of this world uh, the Muslim rulers of this world by these kind of uh, you know, names that is bad and that is takfir which is detested in Islam making takfir without any reason without any valid uh, proof if anybody is making against one another one another then that becomes a crime that is a sin there are two kinds of takfir one is um, takfir mutlaq and takfir mu'ayyan takfir mutlaq is a takfir where you just make in general a statement that a person who commits shirk is a mushrik or a person who does kufr he is a kafir you can say that in general but takfir mu'ayyan when you are particularly specifically addressing a person and then making a statement of that kind to say this man fulan so and so son of so and so he's a kafir is something that you have to be very careful of because unless and until you have the proofs and unless and until you have exhausted the option of you know communicating with him and explaining to him and making that per person understand what the situation is and establishing a hujja proof against him until then you cannot just make takfir against individuals so this is an issue which is a very serious issue now, if at all we happen to ask these people, why do you say so? Why do you say that these rulers, they are munafiqeen and they are kafirs? They would say, you see, they killed a lot of people. One of the allegations is that they killed a lot of Muslims and therefore they are kafirs. That's one of the arguments. The other thing that they say is that they have strong ally with the Yahud and the Nasara. They say they have a very strong bond or relationship ally with our treaty with the uh, Jews and the Christian that's what they say now this is a very these are the two allegations which are made now now I want to just explain these are two extremes that you come across in you know in today's social media you come across two kind of extremes one extreme is that no matter what no no matter what kind of a crime a ruler does they would want to justify that crime and that is something which is detested too See, anybody who does a mistake, it's a mistake. If you don't want to speak against that, at least we have to remain silent. So, instead of remaining silent, if a person justifies the action or a crime, saying that what that ruler did was right, that is also another extreme. 
On the other extreme, people are like, based on those crimes, they go to an extent to say that man has become a kafir or that man has become a, uh, what do you call, uh, munafik. So two extremes. Ahlus Sunnat wal Jama is in between the two extremes. Always, you know, ifrat and tafrit, they say, the Ahlus Sunnat wal Jama is in between the two extremes. They are not negligent and they do not exaggerate. They are in between the two. So we have to be just whenever we are talking. You might wonder why am I talking about this because I am talking about it because my heart is paining. My heart is wanting to address this issue. I really I have good intentions that inshallah our youngsters don't be in such a haste in calling each other as kafir. Please, believers, Muslims, we have to say salam to one another. We have to be good to one another. We have to Islam. We have to correct one another. We have to do all of these things. It takes time. You might not reform the entire world at once, but don't get frustrated at once and say like, you know, everybody has become apostates or they become kafirs or they become hypocrites and all that. See, there can be an element of hypocrisy in a believer. See, there's a statement that I want to make very clear. There can be an element of hypocrisy in a person, a believer. But there's a lot of difference between saying he has got as element of hypocrisy and to say he has become a hypocrite. Hypocrite. Two different things. To call a person as a hypocrite and to say that he has got an element of hypocrisy, they are two different things. It's a whole of a different world altogether. So you cannot, world of a difference, you know, you just can't say like both are same. No, no, no. It's too different. If you're saying there's an element of uh, jahiliya in a person, doesn't mean he has become a jahil. You see, when the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to correct the Sahaba at times when they made some errors, because human beings, they make some sort of errors. The Prophet ﷺ, he never said, you have become a jahil. Rather, he said, you have the traces of jahiliya even now. And after when they corrected the error, the Prophet ﷺ, he complimented them at once, saying that, now you have perfected the faith. Look, this is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Where are we heading, my dear brothers, my dear sisters? Where are we heading? Why are we so quick to call and term one another as disbelievers and, and hypocrites? Why are we doing this? Now, let me come to the point. Just some basic arguments. I don't want to get into complete detail because I'm not a scholar, first and foremost. I'm not a scholar. I'm telling you in front of you and I feel it is my honor to admit the fact that I'm not a scholar. Anybody who mistakes me to be a scholar, please be very clear, I'm not a scholar. I'm just a person who learns something and who shares it with you. If you find there's good, please accept. If you think that is not right, then leave it. If you think that I need to be corrected based on the scholar's opinions, based on the scholar's fatawa, please address it to me. I will also correct myself, inshallah. That is my stand. So now coming to the point, to talk about this issue, the scholars have said you have to differentiate between kufur and kufur duna kufur. There is kufur which is of a highest level and kufur duna kufur is of a smaller kufur. So you have to understand smaller kufur doesn't make a person a kafir. A smaller kufur will not take a person outside the fold of Islam. But a bigger kufur will take a person out of the fold of Islam. So one has to understand what is smaller kufur and what is bigger kufur. If a person intentionally believes certain things and also utters those words of kufur in open way and declares it that this is what he is and this is what his intentions are, then that becomes an open kufur, a blasphemy or anything of that kind, apostasy or whatever. But a person's actions is saying something which is of a level where you feel that there is a sense of disobedience, then that is of a kufur, which is of a lower kufur. But we give it, um, uh, what to say, a benefit of the doubt, benefit of the doubt, saying that the person has done a mistake unknowingly, or he is not aware of this, uh, he needs to be corrected, or he has some reason to do this. We give that benefit of doubt until he declares it openly. So until there is an open kufur, of action or an action in the form of words, you know, uttering the words or even in the form of action, we do not at once call a person a kafir until hujja is established. We have to establish the proofs until we clarify his doubts. 
So we cannot at once say anybody is kafir. And second thing I want to take with other points very quickly. Look, Habil and Kabil, they had a fight, isn't it? Not exactly in the sense Habil did not want to fight, but Kabil, he wanted to kill his brother. Was Kabil a Muslim or a non-Muslim? He was born to Adam alayhi salam, yes or no? So Adam alayhi salam was a prophet and the children of the prophet were Muslims. So Kabil who killed Habil, was he a Muslim or not? He was a Muslim. But if you say just because he killed his brother, he became a disbeliever, then you will have to consider every everybody, every murderer in this world to be a disbeliever if he commits a murder. But that doesn't happen, isn't it? That is not how the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Again, if you see Yusuf salam's brothers who wanted to kill or who wanted to banish him, you know, Yusuf salam's brothers, they took him and they put him uh, inside the well and they left the place so that he dies there or some caravan takes him away. So they separated the son from the father from Yaqub alayhi salam. Yes or no? Yes. Now Yusuf alayhi salam, after he becomes the administrator in Egypt, then there is a point, there's a big lengthy story. I don't want to get into complete uh, story. At last what happens, Yusuf alayhi salam forgives them. See the point that I want to stress here, the brothers who wanted to kill Yusuf alayhi salam, were they Muslims or not? Yes. Did they want to kill the prophet of Islam, that is Yusuf alayhi salam? Yes. So because of that, did they become disbelievers at once? No. So a person just because he kills one person or ten persons or what, whatever, just because he does this heinous crime, he doesn't become a non-Muslim or a disbeliever at once. Well, that is a matter of faith between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What crime he is doing for human beings, he will have to be punished in this world. And whatever Allah wants to do with him, however he wants to deal with them in the hereafter, it's for Allah to deal with him. But as long as he is remaining to uh, obey Allah in the matters of obligations, five daily salah and the five pillars of Islam and six articles of faith, as long as he doesn't you know, speak against these fundamental uh, pillars of Islam, he is still within the fold of Islam. This is what I have to say. Then again, if you see the history of the Sahaba, we have come across Sahaba in later times, you see, uh, we have heard, uh, we have read and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and Aisha radiallahu anha, they had differences. There was a uh, uh, battle of um, Jamal and um, battle, of, battle of Sifin and all of these things happened in these kind of conditions wherein the Sahaba had differences and they had battles, skirmishes because of some people who had instigated. That's a very lengthy story, you know, Abdullah bin Sabah and all that, we will discuss it later. But whatever. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he is having one set of people, believers amongst the Sahaba and Aisha radiallahu anha, she is having the Sahaba who considered her thinking to be right. Now, they had differences, they had skirmishes, they had battles, yet they did not call each other as, you know, kuffar or munafikin, naudhu billah min zalik. This is the stand of Ahlu Sunnat wal Jama. Ahlu Sunnat wal Jama will not be haste in calling anybody as kafirs and munafikin. Just because they attack us, that just because they fight against us, you cannot make one another as kafirs. This is very important. I'm not just saying just to impress upon anybody amongst you. Believe me, I'm not saying that. I'm truly believing in this. I totally believe in this understanding because that's what has convinced me after reading enough literature and sitting with the scholars. So that is the case even when Hussein radiallahu anhu and Yazid, they had differences and there was a problem and we know what was the end of Hussein radiallahu anhu. No way can anybody accept whatever happened to Hussein radiallahu anhu. And we would never say that in any way Yazid is done a good job. No, or his people who supported. No, they did a crime. Whether Yazid was involved in it or not, it was a crime. At the end of the day, you know, we say Hussein radiallahu anhu uh, was martyred and we love Hussein radiallahu anhu. Now the point here is, even when all of these things is happening, Ahlus Sunnat wal Jama does not call Yazid as a kafir. Doesn't call Yazid as a munafik. No. The crime is a crime. Whether he was involved or he was not involved, it is a crime. We don't have two opinions about it. Yet, we leave the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And in this world, if anybody can punish anyone for the crimes, it's for them to do. If you cannot, then it's for you to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leave the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a person just because he kills somebody, that person cannot become a kafir or he just, he just be, does not become a munafik. I mean, as long as it's a battle and as, as long as there's a misunderstanding. Now, I'm touching on certain areas where people might feel, oh, why are you talking about big things? Yes, these are big things for you to understand. Simple thing, you know, when uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal, Rahimullah, or Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah, they were being tortured by the rulers of their times. They did not give a fatwa against the rulers of their times to call them as kafirs or munafiks. They disagreed with the opinions of the rulers. They said what was the haq. The, the, the scholars, they spoke the truth. But no way did they say that these rulers have apostated. No, they did not do that. Why? That is adal. That is justice. So when we read the books like Lumatul Aitqad by uh, Ibn Qudama, uh, is it Ibn Qudama or Abu Qudama? I'm getting confused. Anyways, you people must be. I've read this book and I've also discussed this matter. In that, there is a section wherein uh, I've read how to deal with the uh, rulers, rulers of the land, the Muslim lands, how to deal with them. So whenever you find a mistake done by a ruler, the best thing is what you need to advise by holding his hand. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. We're not supposed to rebel against him. And this is there in the book of Aqidah, in the book of Creed, to understand the Islamic Creed. So can you understand this matter? Can you, can you ponder over this? You cannot just be haste in calling each other as kafirs. No. And again, I have to say, and a very important thing, I've read this um, book by Dr. Sheikh Jafar Idris, Hafidahullah. He writes a book called Process of Islamization. You have to read this book. In this book, he makes it very clear. You can't just say like, you know, black and white. You just can't say like, yes, we have to rule this land uh, according to the book of Allah. Well, no, come what may, we have to do this. And no, it's not like that. Everybody has got a situation. And in every situation, according to what is happening around you, one has to take the right step. If there is a possibility for a person to do dawa, he has to do dawa. If he has to migrate from that place, he has to migrate. If he has to safeguard himself by the enemies who are trying to attacking him, then he has to you know, do self-defense. So everything is different according to the situation. You cannot say, yes, you have to just be doing this you know, across the world at once. No, it doesn't happen that way. And so this book I would recommend for people to read, it's available online process of Islamization and very important point that uh, you know Sheikh Jafar Idris he one time he said all non-Muslims are not kafirs very important point I'm just making it very clear he's saying all non-Muslims are not kafirs but all kafirs are non-Muslims you know this is a very important point why is that he's saying that all non-Muslims are not kafirs because there are many of them who are from the Ahlul Fitra the people who are still in the nature of not associating partners with Allah. There are people amongst the non-Muslims who are saline, who are not able to understand due to their old age. There are people amongst the non-Muslims who are mentally retarded. How can you account them for the, you know, for not knowing about Allah? So there are cases, you know, the people, the four kind of people on the day of res resurrection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would resurrect them and Allah would give them an opportunity on that day. He will make a big fire come out and out of that uh, tongue will protrude. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would command the people then get into the fire. All those who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day, they will enter Jannah. And all those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will enter Jahannam. This hadith is recorded by Shaykh Al-Albani Rahimahullah in his book and uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Jibali in his uh, Iman series in the last days you now one of the volumes he has recorded this hadith and this is a Sahih hadith but can you imagine even uh, in, to the extent Muhammad Al Jibali he goes to say you know you'll never know a non-Muslim being your neighbor in this world he can also be your neighbor in the hereafter in Jannah who is saying this is Sheikh Muhammad Al Jibali not Omar Sharif you understand read that book so what I'm trying to say 
you never know who is what you know an atom weight of iman rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whosoever has an atom weight of iman in his heart whosoever has a mustard weight of iman in his heart he will enter paradise khalas who so what is an atom weight of iman do you know that i don't know a person might have done so much of crime but he might be having the iman in place you understand what i'm saying so because of which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him jannah so don't be haste i want to say about one incident where you all know about this hadith you know it's a very famous hadith i have read it in riyadhus salihin um, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that during the times of bani israel there was a man who committed 99 murders and after committing 99 murders he feels remorseful for what he has done he goes and talks to a monk saying that oh monk would god allah forgive me then the monk says no because you have done so much of crimes 99 murders why would allah forgive you you have done a big crime so after hearing hearing to this the man he gets angry and takes his sword and kills that monk also and makes it a century 100 people and after killing 100 people he goes to a scholar and says i'm being remorseful for what i've done i've killed 100 people would allah forgive me so the alim the scholar says yes why won't allah forgive to allah is ar-rahman is ar-rahim is al-ghaffar is al-ghafur he is the forgiving he is the most merciful why won't he forgive you so he says okay you leave from this place and um, migrate to another land and be with good people and on the way he passes away he dies and it's a lengthy story again he dies and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts him into jannah he puts him into paradise 100 people he had murdered and he was a believer because he goes and says would allah forgive me you understand what i'm saying there's nowhere in between saying that he became a muslim or whatever whenever he committed 99 crimes at that point itself he was a person who believed in allah he goes and talks to a monk and says would allah forgive me so at the time of being a believer he committed 99 murders and the time of being a believer he had committed 100 murders yet when he is remorseful and when he gives up that crime and for the sake of allah he seeks forgiveness and he stops that uh, crime whatever he had done and he makes a very strong intention that he would never repeat in the in his lifetime again so at that point in time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives so he is the most forgiving he is the most forgiving he is more merciful than 70 times of a mother allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his mercy is more than 90 times of a mother so can you understand this more than 70 times of a mother in now 90 more than 70 times of a mother so i was discussing with this 70 times what does that mean 70 times so a scholar when i was talking to him he said whenever in the hadith it is mentioned as 70 times it means infinity it's in the language of the arabs to say infinity they say 70 times when you say 70 times it means it implies it's infinity so that's how it is so there's so much my dear brothers there's so much that we have to really be careful of and uh, we have to be people of adal rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us to be just you know the madina declaration when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to madina on a hijra what was the madina declaration what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say to the jews o oh, jews you and we we are having a pact like if you are attacked or we are attacked we are going to help one another look this is what the the, the kind of understanding the treaty the pact that which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had with the disbelievers the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he, he even said if at all there is a point you know there is a chance for me to establish the hillful fuzul wherein the muslims and the non muslims can sit down the and sort out the issues of the social uh, evils then i am there even now even after being a statesman of a Muslim land, he said he is willing to be part of the Hilful Fuzul. Don't you understand this Sira? Haven't you read this Sira? And again, if you want to understand what was Hudaybiyah, what was Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to perform the Umrah and uh, the disbelievers stopped the believers saying that you cannot perform Umrah. And there was a treaty which was made between the Muslims and the disbelievers treaty was made then at that point in time and they did not perform the umrah they came the next year and umar bin umar, umar bin al khattab radiyallahu anhu even went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said oh prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam aren't you the 
prophet of Allah? Aren't you the Rasul? Aren't you Rasulullah? And he asked all this. And later on, Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu he felt bad so much so that he used to fast many days. So we have read that. But what I'm trying to say, the issue here, what I'm trying to say, Rasulullah sallam, as being a statement, after establishing an Islamic state in Medina, he was still holding treaties with the people, the mushrikeen of Makkah. He was having treaty with the uh, idolaters. He was having treaty with the uh, Yahud. He was having treaty with the Jews. Can't we understand this issue? It's only when people betray the treaty was broken. Otherwise, no. What was conquest of Makkah? When Banu Bakr and Banu Khuza'a, the two tribes, the disbelieving tribes, disbelievers, they had a problem so much so that the Banu Bakr, those who had ally with the, um, the Mushrikeen of Makkah, they killed the members of Banu Khuda'a, the people amongst the Banu Khuda'a who were idolaters, who, who went to Medina from Makkah and complained to Rasulullah complained to Muhammad saying that these people have harmed us, please help us. And that was the point when Rasulullah stood up and the Hudaybiyah Treaty was no more valid and he started to march to Makkah with his men. And he went and that was when you had the conquest of Makkah. Can you understand? Rasulullah stood for the oppressed ones amongst the disbelievers, amongst the idolaters, amongst the Banu Khuda. This is Sira. Don't think that you can never have any kind of ally with the disbelievers. And don't think that a person, if he is commit, if he's committed a major crime, he becomes a disbeliever. No, it's not like that. Let us be fair. Let us be fair. We also know Osama bin Zaid radiallahu anhu one time in a battle when he was fighting an enemy. The enemy he just read the shahada Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said he read the kalima saying that he become a Muslim. But Osama bin Zaid radiallahu anhu he um, you know uses his sword against him and the man dies. And when this matter comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he talks to Usama bin Zaid radiallahu anhu and says, did you open the heart of the person and say that he was telling a lie? Did you open the heart of the person who, whom you, you know, killed in the sword to say that he had lied? No, it was not the case. We don't know. So Usama bin Zaid radiallahu anhu, he felt sad that he has killed somebody in the battle. So that was how Rasulullah was teaching the deen. So what we must understand, just because a person does a, a crime, he doesn't go out of the fold of Islam. So let me conclude, my dear brothers. I'm really pained uh, by looking at the youths today, especially the dais, the duats who are getting misinformed uh, they are getting radicalized i'm sorry to say my calm <laughs> the community that i belong to subhanallah the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is actually fighting amongst themselves and uh, you know calling one another as kafirs and all this is like really sad really sad look we have differences between uh, the sunnis and the shia I'm going to tell you another very important thing which the scholars have said you know the scholars of Ahlus Sunnat Wal Jama people like Sheikh Al Albani Rahimullah Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin Rahimullah they have said very clearly very clearly don't consider every Shia to be a Kafir no it's a wrong thing I'm a Sunni and you cannot say every Shia to be Kafir no it's not like that even there, the same thing applies. What kind of a level of difference he's got? Does he say that Ali radiallahu anhu is a prophet? No, there are many people who don't say that. There are Zaydis who are considered to be very close among the Shia, to be very close to the Sunnis and they are believers. How can you just say, you can't just make one blanket statement against a complete community. No, you can't say that. Be very careful, my dear brothers. We are all small people. We are simple people. Let us not speak big words. There are people, the scholars, let them do that. Let them do what they want. Let them give the verdicts against anybody. Let us not be very quick. It's not our job. Our job, basic things. Pray five times. Go to the masjid. Do some khair. Be good to your parents. Do all of these things. Try to minimize whatever the problems are around you. Try to reduce it. Try, stay away from rebellion attitude. Don't get into rebellious attitude. Please. So this is what I have to say. It's really painful. I'm leaving you all with that. You all have to speak about this. I know. 
I cannot reach the entire world, but I'm sure even if I'm able to reach one person, inshallah, ta'ala, that one person, you also share this thought. And every person after that, share that with another person. If you start sharing like this, inshallah, the rippling effect of this will bring khair, inshallah, and it will add on to the, the scales of good deeds for me and for you, inshallah.